second. So you mentioned Eleusis. It was the the spiritual capital of the ancient Mediterranean that survives for 2000 years. So about as long as we've had Christianity from like 1500 BC to the fourth century AD, there was this annual celebration around the fall equinox where people from all around the Greek speaking world would march from Athens to Eleusis, a pretty, a pretty healthy march and uh, consume this, this beverage, this, this secret beverage called the Kukion and have this, this vision, this vision of the goddesses in which they were absolutely convinced that they had found the secret to life and the key to, to immortality uh, in a single night, which is, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so what was in that beverage was the big question that obtained for, well, centuries really, uh, because it was, it was all, it was all secret. And it was, uh, it was forbidden to reveal what you saw in Demeter's temple there at Eleusis. So the idea was that, yeah, maybe, maybe it was ineffable, maybe it was impossible to put into words, or maybe they wanted to maintain the secrecy to build up this sense of anticipation around this life transforming thing that you would only participate in once. So if you knew what's going to happen, it kind of spoils the whole game. If you show up there with no sense of um, no climax or, or, or surprise. So there's, there's a lot happening as to why it had no name, why it was secret, and like how they maintain the secrecy, which is also crazy. Uh, you know, in, in a culture that was very literate and made records of all kinds of things, for some reason, uh, we have very few indications of what was happening in that sacred temple, one of the holiest places in the ancient world. Wow. So people like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, they all went through this rite of passage, these Eleusinian mysteries. Yeah, as, as as far as we're aware. So like like yeah, like the like the godfather of philosophy himself, Plato, makes allusions to experiencing uh, this blessed sight and vision. He talks about the vision explicitly at Eleusis. Uh, Aristotle says that you go to Eleusis not to not to learn something, uh, but to experience something. Uh, so he says, so we're definitely talking about an experience, a visionary experience that transcends the Greek world. And then even after their civilization falls into a bit of demise, the Romans pick it up and Marcus Aurelius in the second century AD, this is in the time of Christ in the time of early Christianity, uh, Marcus Aurelius not only is initiated, he's the only lay person allowed inside the Holy of Holies and he rebuilds the site after the barbarian Kostavox uh, almost destroy it in the second century. So it was just as sacred and holy to the Romans and to the emperor himself as it was to some of the most famous Greek minds that we know. And this matters, again, because this is the age in which today's biggest religion, the world's biggest religion, Christianity, is being born, right? And trying to scrap out an existence in a world in which these mystery cults uh, were very, very powerful um, and very potent. So do we have any hard evidence of what was in that drink at Eleusis now? No. Well, I mean, I, th <laughs> I think so. We, d we didn't for the longest time, and we've been, we've been dancing around it. So uh, it's, again, so it's, it's forbidden to talk about uh, the potion or, or what happened there. But we do have this hymn to Demeter uh, that goes back even before the classical Greek period. So this is, this is going back 2,700, 2,800 years. There's this, th this hymn that describes, it's sort of like an origin story for how Eleusis becomes Eleusis and Demeter is on the hunt for her, her kidnapped daughter Persephone, who's brought to the underworld by Hades and then she's resurrected. And there's, there's a couple lines about, about this, this potion, the kukion, and it mentions some ingredients. It mentions uh, water, barley, and mint. And that's it. And then there's a long gap in the, the text that came down to us, by the way. So it's kind of curious, like why in the most interesting part, all of a sudden a bunch of lines are missing. Uh, so, but, but, but we have that. And that's, that's like all, all we had. Uh, and in, 19, in the 1970s, I mentioned one of these theories uh, by uh, Carl Ruck and Albert Hoffman, who discovers LSD and Gordon Wasson. They write this book claiming that it was something like ergot. They thought ergot was the magical ingredient of this long lost potion because ergot is how Albert Hoffman himself synthesized LSD. So that's where LSD comes from. Ergot is a, it's like a naturally occurring fungus. Uh, it's very pretty actually, it's this slender blackened rod that shows up on different cereal grains. 
and it sprouts these 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 purple mushrooms. Uh, and it's been around as long as we've been growing the cereal crops or drinking beer, which could be 12,000 years old. It could be 15 or 20,000. Uh, we're not really sure, but it, it's certainly old. And it's a really elegant hypothesis because it's this natural fungus that that shows up everywhere. Um, even brewers today have to be on, on the lookout for ergot. If ergot gets into your, your brew, that can be a very toxic thing. So it's, it's still something we struggle with uh, today. Uh, so the... The theory made sense, uh, but again, it was very difficult to find like organic data to support this. There was no archaeochemistry to speak of. Uh, there was no instrumentation to analyze some of these ancient chalices and cups and vessels. And so that that's where it was left for a very long time until, long story short, I'm looking for, for ways to substantiate this crazy hypothesis. And I come across this uh, this archaeological site in Spain of all places that was excavated in the 90s. And they discovered this tiny chalice that tested positive for the remains of beer and uh, the, the remains of ergot. Uh, so like the, the very fungus that they had hypothesized back in the late 70s, it shows up in this chalice. It's excavated, tested, and basically proven to contain some sort of ergotized beer. And nobody hears about it because the archeological team publishes it um, well, in, in Catalan which not many spe people speak Catalan. And also there, there's some passing references in Spanish, uh, but it's just, it's not picked up by like the wider academic community. And so I reached out to the original team who, who, did, who made the find and did the analysis. Like remarkably, they were still around to answer my emails. And we talked and I went to visit the museum uh, where uh, this chalice was found. I uh, invited Carl Ruck along with me to go see it. And uh, so now, yeah, I think we do have some pretty compelling evidence and data that something like a psychedelic potion was in existence in the classical period, because what they found dates to around the second century BC. So this is before Christ, you know, after the classical period, what they call the Hellenistic period in, in the ancient world. But uh, it certainly opens up like a whole field of investigation uh you know was this just happening there in that little pocket of the ancient mediterranean which was very greek very greek speaking or was it was it also in italy was it in north africa was it in greece itself was, was it in the holy land so it opens up a whole field uh, i think of inquiry where like very serious scholars can take a look at this data uh in the hopes of finding more is this true or not well that really changes your perception of what alcohol and beer could be because you're saying that the current day beer makers are have to be aware to keep this ergot out of the beer but maybe in the past they they encouraged it you know that's what they really wanted right no i mean even, there are german laws that talk about this i mean up until a few hundred years ago like beer was routinely mixed with different plants and herbs and maybe maybe fungi that that's one of the the main points i make in the book is that both wine and beer were routinely mixed with all these different additives and these different ingredients it wasn't about it wasn't about the alcohol uh and i i always make this point that uh, the greeks had no word for alcohol it's that comes from the the, the semitic alcohol so the the greeks had no word for alcohol like the magic and the intoxication that they experienced through beer or wine wasn't because of that of that ethanol it was something like the grain or the or the or the grapes being mixed with all these additives and, and ingredients and we have recipes we have so many recipes that were recorded in antiquity uh, from the fourth, third century BC, all the way through, again, the time of Christ. At the same time that the gospels are being written, we have all these different wine recipes talking about mixing wine with like very, very psychedelic compounds like, like mandrake and henbane and all, all these crazy solanaceous witchcraft plants. So uh, we know that the, this stuff was out there and it survived for, for centuries. And it wasn't until relatively recently that we stopped mixing these things into the beer under, under the, these German purity laws, by the way, uh, in, in the early modern period. So Damn like Germans. The, the, the Germans took all the fun out of it <laughs> for some reason. People were having a great time uh, on these on these toxic beers and wines. And then now now we're, we're left with this. And again, we forget we for, just like the mysteries themselves, this religion with no name, like we, we kind of forget like how old beer really is, which is at least 12,000 years. How old wine really is, which I mean, some of the better data is more like uh, you know six to eight thousand years, 
Uh, but this th th this is really really old technology that was that was perfected uh, largely by by women who were the brewers of this period uh, who mixed the wine of this period and it's a it's a story that that was forgotten for for far too long.